Phantom Power. Phantom Power? Oh, that's so do you have Phantom Power on this? It needs to be on. It's on on here. Oh, okay. This is Phantom Power separate? No. Yes. Um. No, this has to be on the phantom power web and it's it has to be on there. Yeah, but we're not running through the material. Oh you're running through here. We're running right through the yeah. yeah, it's right there.
lesson today is taken from Jeremiah, the 14th chapter, verses 7 to 10, the 19th to 20. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake, for our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. The hope of Israel, its Savior in time of tr trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot get help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people. Truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, the final good, the time for healing, but there is terror and sin. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember, and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or the heavens give showers? It is not you, O Lord, our God. We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. This is the word of the Lord. And we read responsibly from Psalm 82. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts! My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. For those who go through the desolate valley will find yet a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. The second lesson is from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and 16 through 18. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 
From now on, there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous God, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all who deserted me. May it not be counted against him. The Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. I invite the children to come forth for the children's message as they sing Jesus' love. Father, we are sorry when we uh, look to others and compare others to ourselves to make ourselves look better. Help us to turn to you, the one who is above and gives us all things and will also give us forgiveness for doing what we fail to do. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Lord, thank you for coming up today. And I invite the rest of you to stand. The gospel I
rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Parables are frequently confusing, and Jesus intended them to be that way. Jesus said that he taught in parables so that some would hear and others would not hear. It seemed that if there ever was a parable, it seemed clear and self explanatory. It would seem that this parable that we just heard about the Pharisee and the tax collector, or as maybe some of you remember, this tax collector was called the publican, that is sometimes referred to, is really pretty straightforward. <coughs> Jesus tells from the start who should hear this parable. Jesus gets the attention of the people who think they are righteous and declares, This parable is for you. Then, as is usually the case with parables, parables, Jesus makes a sharp contrast. And in this parable, Jesus doesn't leave really much to question about who is who. The Pharisee announces his self-righteousness. The tax collector can say all he can say is to plead for mercy. Jesus declares that the tax collector was justified as he went home, and there is nothing more that this Pharisee can say. Then Jesus summarizes this parable by saying, For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Well, what more is there to say about this parable? Is there anything else to understand? As straightforward as this parable appears, parables often do have an unexpected twist that can surprise us. Maybe there is something more to learn from this parable. To begin with, it is easy for us to focus on the two opposing characters and decide who we are like or who we wish to be like, and then forget about Jesus altogether and what his purpose was in telling this parable to the result first. Well, next Sunday we will be celebrating Reformation Sunday and will once again highlight one of the most important teachings of Jesus, which the Apostle Paul wrote about, which Martin Luther brought again to light in the Reformation, I will emphasize next Sunday, Sunday the basic teaching of what it means to be set free in Christ Jesus. I believe that the parable we just heard is a good example of another teaching of Martin Luther that we can consider today, which has often been shortened to the catchy slogan, Saint and Sin. The complete phrase was shortened, I think, because it wouldn't fit very well on a teacher for a man. So it was simply short to saint and sinner. The complete phrase that Martin Luther intended for his teaching was first presented in Latin. And it was civil eustus epicotus. Well, the first word that was left out in this abbreviated version is simul, which is where we get the English word simultaneously. Then we replace the word eustus, which means justified or righteous simply by saying saint. And then it's yet. It doesn't mean what you ate last night. Yet it means and. The Latin word peccator means sin. Therefore, in English, we would have to say that the tax collector was justified as a saint and a sinner simultaneously. Well, that's confusing. How can one be good and bad at the same time? Few other denominations dare to attack with such an idea or doctrine that seems at first to be contradictory and prefer the simplicity of labeling some either good or evil and using the law to see how they measure up. Well, now maybe this parable isn't quite as clear as it first seemed. Another matter that muddies the water of this parable is to know that the Pharisee represents what is right. And the tax collector did just about everything wrong. Isn't that the reason why you come to church or you send your kids to church to know the difference between right and wrong? 
Would you, who would you want to teach your children? The Pharisee who knew the law well? Or the tax collector who seemed to be good only of breaking the law? And then to make matters worse, it seems that Jesus rewards the bad and condemns the good. But the issue of this parable isn't about who we think is right and who we think is wrong. It is as Jesus said from the very beginning of the parable. It is about who considers themselves as self-righteous and those who know they are sinners. Or another way to say this might be to say the difference between a person who knows they are a sinner and those who find it difficult to admit. common characteristic of the self-righteous is they begin to make their case by comparing their goodness to someone else. And this is exactly what the Pharisee did in the parable. He didn't begin by listing his accolades of goodness. Instead, he distances himself from others and begins his prayer thanking God that he is not like thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even the past. It is after this that the Pharisee points out that he, who he is in life, and then he puts icing on his own cake and listing just a few of the good things that he does. The self righteous person says that he fasts twice a week and tells everyone that he has followed the laws regarding tithing, how much he gives to the church. And then you notice nowhere in this story does the Pharisee ever admit that he has done. The tax collecting sinner is not this way. He doesn't look to others for comparison. He sees how he measures up next to Jesus. He doesn't begin his prayer with thank you. The sinner begins his prayer with have mercy on me. The sinner doesn't tell what he has to give. Instead, he declares he has nothing to offer. He couldn't even look up. Surprise came on his trip back home. Jesus said that this man was justified. At one moment he was a sinner, and in the next he was a saint. And what did this man do to be simultaneously a sinner and a saint? And this is precisely the difference between these two men. The justified man did nothing except admit he was a sinner and begged for mercy. The Pharisee, who thought he was right with God because he considered himself better than others and had a list of deeds to prove it, was not. He was blinded from the sin which was pride in himself. So instead of turning to Jesus, he stood at a distance from the sinner. And worse yet, he distanced himself from God. It might be easy at this point in the parable to side with the tax collector, as Jesus did, and to be thankful that we are not like the Pharisee, who point out the wrong that other people do and pat themselves on the back for the good deeds that they have done. But didn't you just hear what I did? I may have confessed that I was a sinner, but I also justified myself like the Pharisee by being thankful that I'm not like him. And yes, I often find myself. Good news for you and me is found in the last place of this parable. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus has humbled me again today, but he will not let me go home without first exalting me. Jesus makes saints of people who confess they are sinners simply by declaring to them that their sins are forgiven, and they are as quick as he speaks his word, exalted. Being simultaneously justified as a saint and a sinner is like a roller coaster ride. There's a frequent ride down to humility and just as often a ride to exaltation. And this is what happens when we gather week after week to confess to Jesus that we are sinners and then hear his sweet words of forgiveness. And to hear that we are justified as we go through our homes, just as the tax collector did as he was. There was nothing this tax collector did to find favor with Jesus, but Jesus found favor with him. 
This is what Jesus, Jesus' mother Mary knew that he would do in his life. Before he was even born, she announced he had brought the ruler down from his throne, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away. So Jesus has not sent you away empty today. Jesus has spoken to you in his word of forgiveness and in his love for you that he has lifted you as you go on your way home, you will be exalted. Thanks be to God. Amen. We can have another day in your bulletin.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we come to you at the gracious invitation of your Son. May we receive your gifts as little children, that no rebuke of our sinful flesh, the world, or the devil would deter us from turning to you in repentance. Grant us humility to pray. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, do not delight in wickedness, or let the boastful stand before you. Give the leaders of nations wisdom to govern in accordance with your will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others, that they may fulfill their duties with diligence and humility. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, we praise you that you deliver our souls from death and our feet from falling. Care for all that have been asked to pray for. Come to the aid of everyone in need, including this day, Elvina Harvey, Neil Nessheim, Martin Lobdell, Sherry Folds, Marie Doris Croxton, Dorothy Siddig, Donna Lee Boyd, Benny Jean Benjamin, Ryan Boltz, Annie Ballum, Rhoda Wold, Ella Riswold, Paul Robsdahl, Renee Nelson, Jay Bolt, Michael Gross, Gordon Dirksen, Claire Shank Gabriel, Dennis Riswold, John Jurgensen, Daryl McMahon, Paul Hanson, Peggy Walkentine, Darcy Neva, Jennifer Even, and also others whose names we now raise silently to you from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, if we trust in ourselves for righteousness, we are lost and dead in our sins, if you mercifully draw us to you, into your presence, into from our repentance, and hear the cries of those who trust in your Son. Grant us humility, that we may not exalt ourselves or treat our brothers or sisters with contempt. Rescue us from every evil and bring us into your kingdom as your beloved children. To you alone be all the glory, O Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Peace of the Lord be with you all.